Good morning, room 13. Congratulations, it is Friday, and this is the last chunk of the story that we will be reading today. Let's get started. We're going to be reading chapters 14 and 15 today. Let's take a look at our first focus. We're going to move from the, from the relationship between Sal, her father, and Margaret to the relationship between Sal's grandparents and her. Think about how the story events tell us about relationships. Today we'll be reading chapters 14 and 15. Chapter 14, The Rhododendron. One Saturday, I was at Phoebe's again. Her father was golfing, and her mother was running errands. Mrs. Winterbottom had read out a long list to us of where she would be in case we needed her. If we heard any noises at all, we were supposed to call the police immediately. After you call the police, Mrs. Winterbottom said, call Mrs. Cadaver. I think she's home today. I'm sure she would come right over. Oh, sure, Phoebe whispered to me. That's about the last person I would call. Phoebe imagined that every noise was the lunatic sneaking in or the message lever creeping up to drop off another anonymous note. She was so jumpy that I began to feel uneasy, too. After her mother left, Phoebe said, Mrs. Cadaver works odd hours, doesn't she? Sometimes she works every night for a week, straggling home when most people are waking up, but sometimes she works during the day. She's a nurse, so I guess she works different shifts, I said. That day, Mrs. Cadaver was home, puttering around her garden. She saw her from Phoebe's bedroom window. Actually, puttering is not the best word. What she was doing was more like slogging and slashing. Mrs. Cadaver hacked branches off of trees and hauled these to the back of her lot where she lumped them into a pile of branches that she had hacked off last week. I told you she was strong as an ox, Phoebe said. Next, Mrs. Cadaver slashed and sliced at a pitiful rose bush that had been trying to creep up the side of her house. Then she sheared off the tops of the hedge that borders Phoebe's yard. She moved on to a rhododendron bush, which she was poking and prodding when a car pulled into her driveway. A tall man with bushy black hair leapt out, and seeing her, he practically skipped back to where she was. They hugged each other. Oh no, Phoebe said. The man with the bushy black hair was Mr. Berkway, our English teacher. Mrs. Cadaver pointed to the rhododendron bush and then at the axe. But Mr. Berkway shook his head. He disappeared into the garage and returned with two shovels. Then he and Mrs. Cadaver gouged and prodded and tunneled around in the dirt until the poor old rhododendron flopped onto its side. They lugged the bush to the opposite side of the yard where there was a mound of dirt, and they replanted the bush. Maybe there's something hidden under that bush, Phoebe said. Like what? Like Mr. Cadaver, as I told you before. Maybe Mr. Berkway helped her chop up her husband and bury him, and maybe they were getting worried and decided to disguise the spot with a rhododendron bush. I must have looked skeptical. Phoebe said, Sal, you never can tell. And Sal, I don't think you or your father should go over there anymore. I certainly agreed with her on that one. Dad had been there two nights earlier, and I had hardly been able to sit still. I started noticing all these frightening things in Margaret's house. Creepy masks, old swords, books with titles like The Murders in the Rue Morgue, and The Skull and the Hatchet. Margaret cornered me in the kitchen and said, So what was your... What has your father told you about me? Nothing, I said. Oh, she seemed disappointed. I'm going to pause there for a moment because I'm going to put some things together here. I know that they moved to the town so they could be near Mrs. Cadaver. 
I know that she helps Sal's father to get a job. I know that they eat at her house several times a week. And now I know that she hopes that Sal's father is saying things to Sal about her. If I take all these details together, I can be pretty sure that Mrs. Cadaver is hoping that Sal and her father and she will start a family together. I think that may not be what Sal wants, though. Let's keep going. My father's behavior was always different at Margaret's. At home, I would sometimes find him sitting on his bed, staring at the floor or reading through old letters. Or gazing at the photo album, he looked sad and lonely. But at Margaret's, he would smile and sometimes even laugh. And once he touched, she touched his hand and he let her hand rest there on top of his. I didn't like it. I didn't want my father to be sad, but at least when he was sad, I knew he was remembering my mother. So when Phoebe suggested that my father and I should not go to Margaret's, I was quite willing to agree with that notion. When Phoebe's mother came home from running all her errands, she looked terrible. She was sniffling and blowing her nose. Phoebe said that we were going to do our homework upstairs, I said. Maybe we should have helped her put away the groceries. She likes to do all that by herself, Phoebe said. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure, Phoebe said. I've lived here my whole life, haven't I? She looked as if she'd been crying. Maybe something is wrong. Maybe something is bothering her. Don't you think she would say so then? Maybe she's afraid to, I said. I wondered why it was so easy for me to see that Phoebe's mother was worried and miserable. But Phoebe couldn't see it, or if she could, she was ignoring it. Maybe she didn't want to notice. Maybe it was too frightening a thing. I wondered if this was how it had been with my mother. Were there things I didn't notice? Later that afternoon, when Phoebe and I went downstairs, Mrs. Winterbottom was talking with Prudence. Do you think I lead a tiny life? She asked. How do you mean? Prudence said, as she filed her nails. Do we have any nail polish remover? Phoebe's mother retrieved a bottle of nail polish remover from the bathroom. Oh, Prudence said, before I forget, do you think you could sew up the hem on my brown skirt so that I could wear it tomorrow? Oh, please. Prudence tilted her head to the side, tugged at her hair in exactly the same way Phoebe does, and smooshed up her mouth into a little pout. Doesn't Prudence know how to sew? I asked. Of course she does, Phoebe said. Why? I was just wondering why she doesn't sew her own skirt. Sal, you're being very critical. Before I left Phoebe's that day, Mrs. Winterbottom handed Prudence her brown skirt with the newly sewn hem. And all the way home, I wondered about Mrs. Winterbottom and what she meant about living a tiny life. If she didn't like all that baking and cleaning and jumping up to get bottles of nail polish remover and sewing hems, why did she do it? Why didn't she tell them to do some of these things themselves? Maybe she was afraid there'd be nothing left for her to do. There'd be no need for her and she would become invisible and no one would notice. When I got home that day, my father handed me a package. It's from Margaret, he said. What is it? I don't know. Why don't you open it? Inside was a blue sweater. I put it back in the box and went upstairs. My father followed me. Sal? Sal, do you like it? I don't want it, I said. She was just trying to... She likes you. I don't care if she likes me or not, I said. My father stood there looking around the room. I want to tell you something about Margaret, he said. Well, I don't want to hear it. I was feeling so completely ornery. When my father left the room, I could still hear my own voice saying, I don't want to hear it. It sounded exactly like Phoebe. Chapter 15. A snake has a snack. It was hotter than blazes in South Dakota. In Sioux Falls, Gramps took off his shirt, passing Mitchell. Graham unbuttoned her dress down to her waist. Just beyond Chamberlain, Gramps took a detour to the Missouri River. 
He parked the car beneath a tree overlooking a sandy bank. Graham and Gramps kicked off their shoes. It was quiet and hot, hot, hot. All you could hear was a crow calling somewhere upriver and the distant sound of cars along the highway. The hot air pressed against my face and my hair was like a heavy, hot blanket draped on my neck and back. It was so hot you could smell the heat baking the stones and dirt along the bank. Graham pulled her dress up over her head and Gramps undid his buckle and let his pants slide to the ground. They started kicking water at each other and scooping up and letting it run down their faces. They walked in to where it was knee deep and sat down. Come on, chickabitty, Gramps called. Gramps said, it's delicious. I gazed up and down the river, not a soul in sight. The water looked cool and clear. Graham and Graham sat there in the river, grinning away. I waded in and sat down. It was nearly heaven, with that cool water rippling and high, clear sky all around us and trees waving along the banks. My hair floated all around me. My mother's hair had been long and black like mine. But a week before she left, she cut it. My father said to me, Don't cut your sow. Please don't cut yours. My mother said, I knew you wouldn't like it if I cut mine. My father said, I didn't say anything about yours. But I know what you're thinking, she said. I loved your hair, sugar, he said. I saved her hair. I swept it up from the kitchen floor and wrapped it in a plastic bag and hid it beneath the floorboards of my room. It was still there, along with the postcards she sent. As Graham, Gramps, and I sat in the Missouri River, I tried not to think of the postcards. I tried to concentrate on the high sky and the cool water. It would have been perfect except for the ornery crow calling out, Car! 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 Will we be here long? I asked. The boy came out of nowhere. Gramp saw him first and whispered, Get behind me, Chickabitty. You too, he said to Graham. The boy was about 15 or 16, with shaggy dark hair. He wore blue jeans and no shirt, and his chest was brown and muscular. In his hand, he held a long bowie knife, its sheath fastened to his belt. He stood next to Gramps' pants on the bank. I thought of Phoebe and knew that if she were here, she would be warning us that the boy was a lunatic who would hack us all to pieces. I was wishing we had never stopped at the river and that my grandparents would be more cautious, maybe even a little more like Phoebe, who saw danger everywhere. As the boy stared at us, Gramps said, Howdy. The boy said, This here is private property. Gramps looked all around. It is? I didn't see any signs. It's private property. Why heck, Gramps said. This here's a river. I never heard of no river being private property. The boy picked up Gramps' pants and slid his hand into a pocket. This land where I'm standing is private property. I was frightened of the boy and wanted Gramps to do something, but Gramps looked cool and calm. He sounded as if he hadn't a care in the world, but I knew that he was worried about the way he kept itching in front of me, inching in front of me and Graham. I felt around the river bank, pulled up a flat stone, and skimmed it across the water. The boy watched the stone, counting the skips. A snake flickered along the bank and slid into the water. See that tree? Gramps said. He pointed to an old willow leaning into the water near where the boy stood. I see it, the boy said, sliding his hand into another of Gramps' pockets. Gramps said, see that knot hole? Watch what this here piggy, piggy, no, chickabitty can do to a knot hole. Gramps winked at me. The veins in his neck were standing out. You could practically see the blood rushing through them. I felt around the riverbed and pulled up another flat, jagged rock. I had done this a million times in the swimming hole and by banks. 
I pull my arm back and toss the rock straight at the tree. One edge embedded itself in the knot hole. The boy stopped rummaging through Gramps' pockets and eyed me. Gramps said, oh, and flailed at the water. She reached down, pulled up a snake, and gave Gramps a puzzled look. It's a water moccasin, isn't it, she said. It's a poisonous one, isn't it? The snake slithered and wriggled, straining to toward the water. I do believe it has had a snack out of my leg. She stared hard at Gramps. The boy stood on the bank holding Gramps' wallet. Gramps scooped up Graham and carried her out of the water. Would you mind dropping that thing, he said to Graham, who was still clutching the snake. To me, he said, get one out of there, chickabitty. As Gramps put Graham on the riverbank, the boy came and knelt beside her. I'm sure glad you have that knife, Gramps said, reaching for it, as he made a slit in Graham's leg across the snake bite. Blood trickled down her ankle. I grabbed Graham's hand as she stared up at the sky. Gramps knelt to suck out the wound, but the boy said, Here, I'll do it. The boy placed his mouth against Graham's bloody leg. He sucked and spit, sucked and spit. Graham's eyelids fluttered. Can you point us to the hospital? Gramps asked. The boy nodded as he spit. Gramps and the boy carried Graham to the car and settled her in the back seat while I snatched their clothes from the riverbank. We placed Graham's head on my lap and her feet on the boy's lap, and all the while the boy continued sucking and spitting. In between, he gave directions to the hospital. Graham held onto my hand. Gramps, still in his boxer shorts and dripping wet, carried Graham into the hospital. The boy's mouth hovered over her leg the whole time, sucking and spitting. Graham spent the night in the hospital. In the waiting room, the boy from the riverbank sprawled in a chair. I offered him a paper towel. You've got blood on your mouth, I said, and handed him a $50 bill. My grandfather said to give you this. That's all the cash he has right now. He said to tell you thanks. He'd come out himself, but he doesn't want to leave her. He looked at the $50 bill in my hand. I don't need it. You don't have to stay, I said. He glanced around the waiting room. I know it. He looked away and then said, I like your hair. I was thinking of cutting it. Don't. I sat down beside him. He said, it wasn't really private property. I didn't think so. Later, when I went in to see Graham, she was all tucked in bed, <coughs> pale and sleepy. Next to her on the narrow bed, Gramps was lying on top of covers, stroking her hair. A nurse came in and made him get off the bed. He had by now put his pants on, but he looked a wreck. I asked Graham how she was feeling. She blinked her eyes a few times and said, Piddles. Gramps said, they must have given her something. She doesn't know what she's saying. I leaned down and whispered in her ear, Graham, don't leave us. Piddles, Graham said. When the nurse left the room, Gramps climbed back on top of the bed and lay down next to Graham. He patted the bed. Well, he said, this ain't our marriage bed, but it'll do. And that's all for today. See you soon.